Hello, I am very delighted to be joined today by the brilliant Dr. Um, Hanan Ashwari, who has so many hats, won huge numbers of awards throughout her very esteemed career. The Sydney Peace Prize just been won. Uh, but in my lifetime, I would say one of the most prominent Swakes people, actually, of the Palestinian people. I remember when I was a teenager, first interested and engaged in the issue of Palestine, it was often your face that I would see on our TV screens discussing this issue. So it's always, it's a huge honor to be able to speak to you today. So hello. Hello, thank you Owen, it's good to speak to you. Can I just start actually, um, Anna, because I've been, Dr. Anna, because I've been speaking about this a lot um, over the last few days, and that's the question of South Africa's submission to the ICJ accusing mm -hmm. Israel of genocide. Now, mm -hmm. you've been a, a, a kind of a representative, as I said, a spokesperson um, over many years um, for the Palestinian people. You've had to negotiate and talk to and discuss with US and European counterparts. I'm just wondering, I mean, you've seen the US and, and the West be complicit in terrible crimes committed against the Palestinian people. But just in terms of now, just your perspective on we've got to the point of South Africa filing Nelson Mandela's nation, filing genocide against South Africa, a very detailed document for anyone who reads it, thoroughly mm -hmm. evident. And yet this is with the active support of the US and most European governments. And just what's your just response to that kind of context? First of all, I think the filing of the uh, genocide case is extremely significant. It's very important. It's about time. And we are deeply grateful to South Africa. Now, I know there's a Hasbara campaign in Israel to malign South Africa. And so it happens all the time. But uh, the, the fact that they did it, the fact that there is one country with the guts to stand up to the U.S. and Israel, and to really begin a process of accountability for Israel is absolutely important because the U.S. has in many ways paralyzed the multilateral system, including the ICC, which we've been trying to get to for years and that has refused to uh, function when it comes to Palestine. But now as a state, uh, uh, South Africa has been able to file this case and it has sufficient evidence to show intent and to show practice actually implementation. The thing is, this is not just an issue of uh, South Africa. Many people, I know individuals who are signing petitions in support of this. I'm surprised that not many countries have joined the lawsuit against Israel. This is a very clear case of genocide that is happening in, in uh, view of the whole world. It is unfolding in public. It is being recorded. And it is being celebrated in many ways by the perpetrators of the, the genocide, whether it's the army or the political uh, echelons in Israel, and with very clear intent and a repetition of, of the objective of this uh, uh, slaughter of, of the carnage in Gaza, of the total destruction of, of everything Palestinian or everything that supports and sustains life uh, in addition to the siege and so on. So it's a very significant move because from the beginning, <laughs> if you want me to go back to the beginning, the creation of the state of Israel was based on, first of all, myths, the myth of a land without a people for a people without a land, which was also the other side of the coin, the negation and erasure of the Palestinian people. So you have preferential treatment for Israel uh, and, of course, the negation uh, and the invisibility of Palestine, which was repeated in several ways in the Balfour Declaration where you we were uh, described as a non-Jewish minorities or communities huh. in our own land. I mean, the, the audacity of writing the statement that you want to establish a, a, a Jewish home in Palestine for a minority, less than 10% of the people owning less than 6% of the land. Huh? And yet you say without prejudice to the civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish communities. So we were described not as a people with the right to self-determination, not as the indigenous people on our own land, not as the majority who have the right, but as not, they, they defined us by what we are not. And I find that really telling significant that the small minority that was given such massive power and land and a gift of other people's lands uh, was the defining factor 
and the Palestinians were the negative factor as being non-Jewish. And we have only religious and civil rights. So that started this trajectory where Israel's impunity was fed, Israel, uh, a sense of entitlement and exceptionalism and ability to act outside the law and outside the norms of any decent human behavior persisted. And of course, the Palestinians constantly negated, bashed and denied. And this started again, it continued with the Nakba. People think it started with the Nakba. No, the Nakba was the one significant station in which Israel was really created. But the mentality behind it, the fundamental Zionist mentality was there before the Nakba. Now, the Nakba was also based on what Ilan Papi calls the, the uh, displacement replacement paradigm. You mm. want to displace a whole people in the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, and you want to replace it with another. And the displacement is not just physical, it's not just demographic, it is territorial, it is cultural, it is historical. Uh, so you want to appropriate everything, the land, the narrative, even the names of places, uh, the history, the, the culture, the rights, everything has to be uprooted, displaced, distorted, denied, and Israel brought in in order to superimpose a state on other people's lands, on the indigenous people's lands, and with a total denial of every definable factor. And this trajectory continued, mm -hmm. 67 and so on, where I, I just don't see how people, how the whole world was so silent, watching an occupying power with full military power, with full Western support. And we see Israel as, of course, a, a colonial outpost. It's an extension of the colonial era, as you know. Having the full support to carry out uh, war crimes, killings, to run our lives in every possible way, to steal our lands, our resources, to enter your home and terrorize you, to kill people, to shoot at will, to imprison. I mean, look, we used to say they, they imprisoned a million. It's, it's even more than a million by now <laughs> with this latest. Or that they killed, uh, uh, it was 75,000 uh, people. Palestinians, now it's over 100,000 Palestinians have been killed. So this has been ongoing, gradually, systematically, uh, racial displacement, replacement, expulsion. And they gave themselves, this is what's so unconscionable, I don't know how people accepted this, the right to inflict so much deliberate, willful pain on people, individually and collectively the right to torture, the right to uh, imprison without any kind of due process or without any charge or trial or conviction or anything, uh, to, to carry out extrajudicial executions, to steal your land, to build more settlements. And I don't want you know the whole story, but this has been ongoing systematically. And somehow we never got recourse to all the legal instruments and the judicial instruments that were available to other people. And we tried, we tried desperately uh -huh. to get to the, uh, for example, the ICC that Ocampo, who works as an advisor for Israel now, wanted us to become a state. Otherwise we cannot address the ICC if we're not a state. And so he delayed any kind of, of uh, uh, discussion or investigation of Israeli war crimes until we became a state. So in 2012, we became an observer state. The UN gave us a state status. So uh, under uh, Fatou Ben Souda, we were able to present a case in, in 2016, I think, or 2018. And we waited, no, 2016. We waited seven years. They were still debating whether we could present a, a case in the, the ICC. And we had submitted files and files and evidence and state and everything, lawyers, states, countries, and they still debated. Now with Karim Khan, of course, he's doing nothing. Mm -hmm. He just looked, what, because there was uh, uh, an assault on, on uh, Israel, he came and visited Israel and didn't even enter Gaza. And 
I mean, this kind of double standard, this kind of failure, I don't want to say hypocrisy. Of course, the international community is, is hypocritical, but it's a failure of, of carrying out their fundamental rights. Now, this failure has come to a head in the sense that there was one country that had the guts and the know how and the experience and the integrity and the moral fiber to be able to present a lawsuit with such detailed and convincing and systematic presentations and evidence. That is important because the significance, the implications, means that the days of impunity, of lack of accountability, of full support and cover uh, by the West primarily are over. That now they cannot shield Israel from the consequences of its own actions. That the days in which Israel could act as a rogue state and deal with the UN with total disdain and bomb one country here, another country there, you know, destroy Palestinians, steal their land and so on, without any by your leave, this is over now. Because the whole issue has been laid wide open. And now it is the responsibilities of countries who have signed on to the uh, uh, genocide, anti-genocide or prevention of genocide uh, convention, have the responsibility to act accordingly. While with the ICC, when we got earlier rulings or whatever, they didn't because it was individual cases and so on. Mm -hmm. And we got once an ICJ ruling, which nobody followed that on to. Now, because of a sense of urgency, because it's still an ongoing genocide, mm -hmm. it has to happen in order to prevent its continuation before we get the final ruling. So the question of prevention becomes very important. And the, the question of accountability now is, is very serious. On, on that question of accountability, I mean, Western states are playing what I, I'd say is quite a transparent game. I want to see what, what you think about this. In that you've had some, for example, the US and Britain and elsewhere, um, not very, not very, kind of quite junior ministers, uh, condemn rhetoric coming from, say, the most, I'd say, vulgar uh, Israeli ministers talking about um, the forced, the, the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, uh, um, like Smotrich, and they'll condemn that. Um, and it, and it's, it's a game in a, in a sense to say, look, we're doing something. We're, we're, we're taking on, um, 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 you know, we're, we're moderates here. We're obviously we'll take on the excesses. But it's easy to go for those ministers rather than, say, Netanyahu and the government itself. I'm just wondering what your thought is about that, because at the moment you are getting hand by the West. Basically. I'm glad you asked this. I'm glad you raised this issue. It's a sub to their conscience. It's saying, you know, it's justifying doing nothing. It's justifying the lack of genuine accountability huh? by saying, OK, look, we're good guys. You know, we've identified Smotrich and Ben Gvir as the bad guys. Huh? It's the whole system, for heaven's sake. It's the whole government. It's the army. It's a whole coalition. It's not, It's like saying you shouldn't, you should curb the, the excesses of the settlers in the West Bank. Well, for heaven's sake, you are arming the settlers as you speak. Huh? And it's the Israeli army that is protecting the settlers and is raiding people's homes and terrorizing uh, people alongside the settlers. So it's a matter of policy and support and, and so on. And you cannot just pick out and say, you know, these are a few wild weeds, the, the settlers, the, the extremist settlers. And in the same way, you cannot say this is Ben Gvir and Smotrich. This is a whole policy for heaven's sake. And it's been carried out and in full view because they are gleefully boasting about what they're doing. They are posting <laughs> videos of what they're doing. And the way they, they express this, this, this evil, I have no other word for it, of uh, the possibility of a nuclear bomb, you know, as being one option, or that he doesn't want the Palestinians to die, it's too easy, they have to suffer more. Uh, we want to destroy everything that they have and their children and their homes and their institutions. I mean, there is such a willful ex exposure of such hate and racism, hmm? Yeah. And lack of any self-critical distance between themselves and what they're doing. And the West that has instantly, I mean, Europe, and of course, it's basically it's the U.S., but then Europe is an appendage to the U.S. The way 
the way Biden ran over to, to Israel, right? And he swallowed the Israeli version instantly without any kind of uh, verification, without waiting to see whether it's true or not, without getting advice from even his own uh, people, immediately started regurgitating the Israeli version. And we know for decades that Israel is expert at manufacturing versions and getting that lie out there, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it till it gains a life of its own, and that's it. Now, they didn't even have to repeat it instantly. Biden swallowed it, followed by Blinken, followed by that horrible spokesperson, what's his name, Kirby, hmm. and the, the uh, uh, Department of Defense. And everybody started repeating the horrific stories. And not only that, but the European countries picked that up huh? and repeat. And they made policy on the basis of lies, frankly speaking. So that, that issue has framed not just public perceptions, especially with mainstream media and so on, but framed policies. Framed pol Germany immediately took a decision to suspend all support for the PA, for heaven's sake. They're your guys, the PA. They're the ones you want to combat uh, uh, Hamas. And yet you st they, they started, we had the Swiss agency, the development agency, suspend funding for civil society institutions in the West Bank, including one of my own. I couldn't believe this. The Europeans immediately acted on a knee-jerk response to a... a, a a manufactured version without waiting for verification, without talking to the other side. That started now trying to show that they are no the good guys. It's like saying, it's like Biden saying, we, we believe that Palestinians and Israelis should have equal uh, uh, freedom and prosperity and democracy and blah, blah. What? And here you are depriving us of your freedom, siding with Israel, no democracy. No. The same thing, Israel can do whatever it wants. We are for a two-state solution while Israel is destroying it. So this disconnect between some of the language to appease huh, either public opinion, their own or others, or to say we are not entirely one-sided, and the lack of will and astuteness and responsibility to deal with the real issues. This is a serious problem. And this has betrayed a sort of, it's not just a divide between North and South. I mean, the global South is acting right now and is moving. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and not just East and West. It's very clear. I mean, these are the divides here and there. But it's a question of how the, the victims were being treated historically and how people who have... Uh, a legacy of, of uh, victimizing, of exploiting, of oppressing other peoples uh, who are not necessarily of their own color. Uh, this mentality has been internalized and it came out now. And how all that language about rule of law, human rights, international humanitarian law, the, the holding people to account, the responsibility to protect, we had all these things, we believed that. Nobody ever protected the Palestinians. I mean, just on, so, the, on that, yeah. I wanted to ask you, just because you, you mentioned it there just before, about the question of anti-Palestinian racism, actually, which I don't think actually is discussed sufficiently in, in terms of how this shapes all of this. Because actually, you know, one of, the, one of the things the apologists of Israel have done is turn the world upside down and say that the real dangerous, hateful, racist extremists are those who oppose the mass murder of the Palestinian people and support rights for the Palestinian people. Um, when actually anti-Palestinian racism, I have to say, in the last few months since this began, it's not been particularly subtle. There's not been a pretense of Palestinian life having worth. I'm just interested yeah. in terms of the industry I work in, the media, but also obviously the world of politics, the, the West, just anti-Palestinian racism and, 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 and how it manifests. Exactly. It manifests itself in many ways. I mean, it's been a pattern. It's not something new. But it has come out in the open and mainstream media contributed. So, look, when we were talking about it, it was then I think 5,000 or 7,000 Palestinians had been uh, slaughtered by Israel. 
Biden said, I don't believe the Palestinians. Oh. I mean, I don't believe the numbers. I don't. I mean, my God, you swallowed the idea of 40 kids and beheaded people and burned on, and you you don't believe numbers that were being officially presented. So that is a predisposition to not just to dismiss, to demonize, to dehumanize, which is what Israel did, and everybody picked it up. I can't believe the, the, the tales, the tall tales that are being said and that people pick up and repeat without mindlessly repeat, unless there is a predisposition. And because in the West there is that predisposition, along with the sense of guilt about the Holocaust, which is a European phenomenon, it's certainly we have had nothing to do with it, even though it, it uh, really affected our lives. But uh, in a sense, this predisposition to hold the Palestinian guilty until proven guilty or to dismiss them entirely Mm -hmm. And all these myths from uh, the U.S. and others of shared values. I keep telling what shared values? Occupation, oppression, land theft, war crimes, crimes against... These are the values you share with Israel? Or the Judeo-Christian tradition? What Judeo-Christian tradition? Uh -huh. Does that mean that there are others who do not share your values? Does that mean that the other is totally excluded if you happen to be non-Jewish or non-Christian. I mean, these prepared, these lay the foundations of such uh, uh, anti-Palestinian uh, racism. And of course, the hate that has been building up and coming out in Israel, because I think there are several reasons. One is the fact that they all know, deep down, that they committed a serious crime and injustice against the Palestinians. Many Israelis tell me they do know, but they don't want to admit it. And they feel on the defensive and they have to totally dehumanize the victim so they don't have to feel responsible. I don't want to psychoanalyze them, but I know for many years, many Israelis told me, we are afraid of you because if we did, if somebody did to us what we did to you, we will not forgive and forget. Huh? So we're afraid that you will want to take revenge on us. That's one. But no, on the other hand, there is in the West, which with its very rich colonial past, a tendency to believe the worst of uh, uh, non-whites, primarily non-Christians or whatever. But uh, and and uh, since Israel was a Western phenomenon and the creation of the West, and because of the guilt uh, over the Holocaust, and because it is a functional state for the West, after all. I mean, it has been presented by the U.S. as the, the major source of uh, weaponry, research, uh, uh, in, intelligence, uh, as, uh, spyware, uh, and so on and, and so forth, to the point where it was their protégé. And the fact that it failed to stop uh, a group of fighters who are not an army, who are not a disciplined army, the fact that all this weaponry and so on that was uh, sold to the world as being, you know, uh, infallible because you have an invincible army, all this collapsed on October 7th, so they went overboard. The, the language of racism and hate, we've been warning against this for decades, for years. We've been saying that this language, this culture of hate, in Israel. And it was picked up uh, by the West in a systematic way, and blaming the victim became an issue, plus erasing not just the humanity of the Palestinians, but the fact of the occupation itself. I'm sure you have noticed that they never contextualize, they never mention the occupation, they never mention the historical injustice done to the Palestinians, they never mention the fact that we are literally held captive with mm. no rights. Mm. They don't do that. And, and the evaluation of our rights and life. No, no, no. The language has been expurgated, you know, redacted, so to speak. It's as if it began with the Palestinians woke up one day and decided they don't like the Jews. Well, this has nothing to do with being Jewish or non-Jewish. The Palestinians don't like their oppression, mm. and they don't like their oppressor, mm. and they don't like the occupation. But trying to superimpose on us all these labels and trying mm. to create false analogies the way Netanyahu did after October 7, talking about this is 
this is uh, uh, like the Holocaust. They're killing us because we're Jews or whatever. Or this is ISIS. All these, you know, trying to generate with these buzzwords instant responses to demonize the Palestinians as a whole and hence to justify a priori all the horrors, the genocide, the slaughter, huh? the carnage that they're committing in Gaza from the beginning. So, someone put that well I saw the other day saying, yes, as if the idea that um, the Palestinians would have no problem with their land being taken away from them if it was somebody else who did it. And it was because, yeah, this is an absurdity. Just a, a couple of final things. Um, uh, one, I just wanted to ask about the assassinations um, of um, Hamas leaders, for example, in, in Lebanon. Um, and I'm just interested in terms of, I mean, Israel obviously deny, well, they don't accept responsibility, but everyone knows it's Israel. Um, if other states, if they did that, if they suddenly started taking out, because many would argue, well, you know, this Israeli general has committed war crimes. So why, why don't we just, why don't we take out this Israeli general? That logic would not apply uh, in other cases. But it does show, doesn't it, that Israel has basically been granted exceptionalism in international dealings. It has been given carte blanche to behave in a way that other states couldn't do. Even if they said, well, this person has committed war crimes and committed this or that atrocity, you can't just blow them up in some other country's capital. Well, Israel got used to being judge, jury, and execu executioner when it comes to Palestinians. Actually, when it comes to the whole region, they're the ones who bombed Iraq because they said it had the nuclear weapons when it yeah. didn't. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who regularly shell and bomb Syria, for example. Uh, they assassinate people, whether they're Iranians or others. They, they assassinate Palestinians all the time. And so the whole history of the relationship between Israel and the Palestinian national movement was based on what we call political decapitation of the Palestinians. Yeah. They've assassinated our leaders historically. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we talk about Khalil Wazir, Abu Jihad, or uh, Abu Iyad, or the three Kamal uh, Nasser, Kamal Adwan, and Abu Yusuf al -Najjar. I mean, I can give you a whole list, even poets, even <laughs> friends of ours, musicians. They have a long history of assassination as a way of attempting to and the national uh, movement and, and the days of the revolution, of course, down to uh, Yasser Arafat. I firmly believe that he was killed. Mm -hmm. So you have all these this history because the world never stopped Israel because it used this as a tool of attacking its enemy. And they again, they, they decontextualized everything. And they didn't talk about, and they never mentioned, and the world tries to forget the fact of the occupation, subjugation, captivity, even enslavement of a people. And it's as if it is out of a pure vacuum. Huh? They want to kill these people because they're bad guys. Well, how do you know they're bad guys? Uh, Who uh, are you to judge they are uh, bad guys? We see bad guys every day. We see soldiers and, and uh, officers and so on, killing people on the ground, two teenagers shot in cold blood, wounded. Every day we see this happening. If we use that logic, then we have the right to assassinate everybody. Huh? But this is why, supposedly, there is a global rule of law, supposedly. This is why there is international humanitarian law. But Israel has always acted as a rogue state outside the law because it has been granted immunity to act with full impunity. And now it has done several things by assassinating Saleh al-Aruri. It did this in a place, first of all, it wanted to kill all Hamas leaders, it said. But it went to Beirut. It couldn't get to them in Gaza. Uh, so they went to Beirut and to the Dahye, and as a direct affront to Hezbollah. So in a sense, it's like saying, I can violate the sovereignty of states. I can continue the decapitation, political decapitation of Palestinian leaderships, political leaders. I can continue with uh, acting outside the law the way I, and I can provoke another confrontation oh. outside Palestine, so to speak. And this is a very dangerous policy which emanates from a sense of arrogance, entitlement, exceptionalism. Arrogance, it's, not, it's even beyond hubris, <laughs> I think. This type of, of arrogance would lead to uh, all sorts of uh, 
sense of superiority and ability to get away with things. And, and they've been allowed to, to get away with things. But it also leads to complacency. Complacency where you can assume that the pattern that has been in effect decades now, giving Israel, granting Israel the right to do all these things, will continue. But at a certain point, there will be excess, there will be a cessation, there will be a reaction, and people will say that's enough. And now it's beginning to happen. Why? Because it's no longer the Israeli narrative that is distorting reality. Now people have access to news, to information. It's not mainstream media. The younger generation is beginning to seek the truth. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there is an international solidarity movement. There's a network that is speaking a new language that okay. is exposing the hypocrisy and the horrors. Huh? And they are no longer going to get away with it. And I mean, on that, that, that's my final question, really. I mean, in terms of, and I keep asking this, trying to desperately find hope in what is a, a desperately um, horrific situation right now, um, a desperate situation in, in so many ways. But, you know, you're in the West Bank where, you know, we've seen this onslaught as well, which has not really been discussed enough. Um, huge. I mean, even before 7th of October, 240 Palestinians were killed this year alone. Uh, dozens of them yeah. children, uh, settler violence. We're seeing Palestinians driven from their homes, all in an attempt to continue what began many decades ago, which is the deliberate attempt to drive Palestinians from their land and make national self-determination for the Palestinian people impossible. Yeah. So I just wonder, where do you see the hope? Is it partly the fact that you're right, if you look at polling in the US, the most pro-Palestinian generation ever, the younger generation, uh, the fact you are, you know, this has is horrendous, beyond horrendous as this situation is, it has politicized a lot of people. I can see that alone. I can see that in the responses to the videos that I do. People who, for the first time, are being politicized on this issue. Is that yeah. where the hope comes from, or is there other hope as well? Yes. I think Israel has overstepped too many limits, not just this limit. It's gone too far beyond what any decent, sane, moral human being can accept or justify even to himself or her. So it has exposed its own real uh, anti-Palestinian racism and the inherent violence. There is so much violence and mm -hmm. racism there. It has exposed it for all to see. And, and it has, uh, in a sense, begun the deconstruction of fundamentalist Zionism and settler colonialism. This type of deconstruction did not need the, the uh, spin machine, the Hasbara, all this talk, all these lies and so on. All people needed to do was look at, at the facts, at what's happening. And so in, in many ways, the deconstruction of Zionism as an exclusionary and ex exclusivist system is beginning to be seen. When they legislated the nation state law, where they said only Jews have the right to self-determination in historical Palestine, which they called their Israel, a very clear racist statement which is very exclusivist and which is based on a sense of superiority and entitlement. That did not even raise a question. Everybody started repeating, well, of course, this is a Jewish state. No, it's not. Suppose I come to you and say, no, no, I want Palestine to be exclusively Christian. Hmm. Huh? Hmm. Or Palestinian you know, Christian, yeah, people might not be aware of Palestinian Christian like yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the land of Christianity, for heaven's sake. We are, we are, we are the descendants of the all the earliest Christians in the world. So suppose I say, no, no, this is early Christian Christianity. I've descent from centuries and therefore I, I want this as an... Suppose any Muslim says, I want an exclusively Muslim state and nobody has any rights unless they're Muslim. We criticize these people. We, but everybody says, of course, Israel has to be a, a, an exclusively Jewish state. No, you do not gain preferential treatment and value on the basis of your ethnicity or religious affiliation or whatever. You do not. Huh? There are basic human rights, which, of course, the global system, the so-called rules-based system, was preaching to the rest of the world and to the third world and to the south and so on. You have to be like a civilized, uh, like good old white men. There are some white women who are <laughs> also... Uh, not, not quite uh, moral when it comes to uh, oh. racism. But still, still, I think uh, uh, ultimately, 
this kind of, of excess, this kind of feeling that there are no limits, this kind of a sense of, you know, we are literally God's chosen people. And when you hear the, the uh, extreme right-wing rabbis say we have the right to kill them, I, I don't know if you, I don't want to repeat such fake language anyway, you will see what kind of uh, distortions there are on the psyche of a whole nation. I don't know how that they're, they're going to live with this or with themselves in the future. What will happen if people decide that Israel has to be held to account as a state, has to be bound by the laws that, you know, bind other states, and not as uh, some, some unique special uh, uh, entity. So that people will have to live with that, that they are not exceptional, that they do not have the right to inflict pain and to destroy and to kill and, and to... That's why, to go back to the beginning, this genocide case is very important. And it is not out of the blue. It came because Israel was enabled and supported and allowed to continue in this path, which led to genocide. They were carrying out ethnic cleansing gradually. They were carrying out war crimes gradually. They were killing people, Palestinians, gradually, slowly. Now in the West Bank, as you know, we talked about the West Bank, young, young men are being assassinated, extrajudicial assassinations. People, the army enters homes, terrorizes people. They're even stealing people's money and, and jewelry and so on. They are uh, bulldozing the, the infrastructure, the, electricity, the, the water pipes, the sewage system, everything. They want to make life intolerable for Palestinians. In Gaza, they're doing it en masse, huh? yeah. Yeah. in a very horrific, dramatic, obvious way. In the West Bank, it is being carried out systematically, starting with refugee camps, with isolated yeah. areas, with the north, where there is some resistance and so on. So the, the uh, idea behind it is the same which is ethnic cleansing, which is the fact that they want to superimpose greater Israel on all of historical Palestine. And the fact that this kind of lawlessness and, and uh, unaccountable behavior cannot be contained. When Israel lacks accountability, it incorporates the sense of impunity within its own system, including its legal system. How many soldiers, how many settlers, how many people who violated every law possible have been held to account in Israel if the victim is Palestinian. 97.5%, if not more, never, of cases never got tried or they were dismissed or they were uh, counted innocent, nothing. And if they get in any way, any kind of sentence, this handful of cases, it is reduced and then it is uh, canceled. So this sense of impunity, is important because it has begun to permeate everything that people do. Oh. And it is a sense of entitlement that we are not bound by any laws, whether they are international or domestic or moral or human or the laws of common decency even. And that is going to create one strange nation mm -hmm. that can look at genocide and not just justify it, but celebrate it. This is crazy. I think that's a very powerful place to, to end. And I think, I think, again, there is hope there in the sense of what you spoke about in terms of how this has been, I think, a salutary experience for, for many people in states which prop up Israel. But you can see in the here and now, so in the here and now, for example, of the West Bank, this horrific onslaught and how that reflects or is part of that historical context you spoke of, which is the mass dispossession of the Palestinian people and attempt to crush their rights to national self-determination. Dr. Hanan, it's always such an honour to speak to you. And you speak so beautifully and, and, and eloquently and, and passionately, but also with so so much of that historical context, which we desperately need right now. So uh, please do share this video, like this video for those watching or listening. But to Hanan, thank you so, so much. My pleasure. Thank you all.